Yeah, I think a couple things, and this is a this is a really strong push that that I'm driving our group on uh, the last couple of years, and then moving forward. And and and, and the, the first one is how to deliver skating for young players. Um, I think in my era, there was the line skating and the the edge work and the the power skating and and so on and so forth. And and we work very closely with the Finns and the Swedes. So we. Each country has similar to our setup. We actually stole it from them um, where we have regional managers. So we do crossovers. I'll be doing a crossover with the Swedish Federation here in another month. But uh, um, I'm also a mentor coach for the the um, IHF. But um, when we when we when we talk about this with our, our fellow uh, player development managers in other countries, it's the same issue that they that they see, and, and that is how do you deliver skating with a read, a decision, with conflict, and what I call purposed skating. Because when I see coaches do Russian circles and edge work for 20 minutes at the beginning of practice, I mean, imagine the mentality of selling a kid on a sport, and then the first 20 minutes is going to be stuff that's monotonous, boring, no game-like situation, not fun, no decisions, not challenging. We're just going to get this work in, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. And if you think about how songs are written and movies are made, um, the marketing piece of our sport, how do we get kids excited about coming to practice? How, how do we make it entertaining and fun? So how can we deliver a really important part of our game, skating technique, in a fun, productive um entertaining manner and there's a million ways to do it it's just getting people out of out of their comfort zone and then the second part of it is and it was mentioned by by alan and and also by by barry and that is the play off the puck night we know through analytics 98 percent of the games played without the puck yet we also know that 99 percent of the feedback coaches give players is what they do with it or on it and so if 99% of our feedback is about 2% of the game, we're not making hockey players. And so how do we create those scenarios and those, those uh, game-like situations where we put kids in situations where they have to our, – our focus is player one on each team. What about player two through six? What about the reads the goalie has to make? What about all the plays off the puck? The best goalies I've coached. We're never the most athletic. Timmy Thomas, Jan Denis, they weren't the they weren't the best the best players athletically. They weren't the fastest post to post. They didn't have the best glove hand. But both of them were unique in that they they weren't a goalie until they were about twelve. And everybody thinks that's a really important thing for a goalie because of the physical aspect. But what about the ability to read the game? What about the ability to understand the patterns? To understand what a player might be thinking on a two-on-one. To think about where the puck might be coming on the half wall on a power play. What angle would be coming to the net. So are we putting our players two through six in situations consistently, under conflict, under duress, that forces them to make reads and it forces them to earn the puck? Because in our sport, unlike any other, for the most part, once you score, you still got to earn the puck back. You don't, it's not your turn. So can we create that environment in our practices where my decisions, my effort, and my execution is rewarded with offensive opportunities? And to me, that's, that's what we're trying to get our coaches to grasp, is creating that culture and environment that's game-like that forces our players to be really hard work, work early. Like so many players work late because they don't read the game well. So they're a step, they're a step behind. So how do I work early to get myself, the great players all work early. That's why they're in the right spot. That's why they have the puck more. That's why they score goals, right? We call it anticipation. But to me, anticipation is working early off of a read, right? And so, we can we can call it anticipation, but how do we deliver that to our athletes? What how, is that? A, is that an actual deliverable concept, or do we get them to work early because they make a good read, 
And can we create that culture every day in our practices? And that's where Bill Beanie was way ahead of the curve on everybody else in the world. Way, way, way ahead of the curve. Um, and and it, when he was explaining it to coaches, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, 90s, 2000s, and even today, for some of them, it's like talking, you know, a foreign language. They just can't, they can't grasp it. Um, uh, but to get them to, to embrace some of it, as Al said earlier, even if it's just a couple pieces of it, the impact is profound. So I, everything you guys are saying is exactly what we're trying to deliver. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a full-time job and there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of naysayers, but those that buy in and, and are really committed, um, because the, the early stages are going to be difficult. As Al mentioned, people will leave, people will not believe. And even when <laughs> Al is going to learn this quickly, even with the success that he's going to have with developing players, people are still going to leave because they think the grass is always, in fact, you're probably going to be a product of your own success. <laughs> Better players are going to, you're going to develop really good players and they're going to go somewhere else. Um, but you just got to stay committed to it because you got to, you got to, you got to do what's right for the kids. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're in the business for.